Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. You no. actually had an ejection in a GR3, didn't you? Can you tell us about this? Yes, I did. This, this happened some years later when I was an instructor on the uh, conversion unit at Wittering. Um, and I was loaned out to number three squadron out in Germany for one of their tactical evaluation exercises, uh, which were carried out by NATO. So I was fortunate enough to be allocated to the same field site as my good friend Paul Hopkins, who was based out in Germany at that time. So I was living on the field site with him. Um, we had a nice night out in the pub the night before. The next day I was in the cockpit and we were actually, I think, yes, we were actually on, on evaluation exercise then. It was a bit Monday morning, I suppose. I'm, I'm not really sure. But anyway, I was flying with a, a very good friend of mine, Les Evans, and we were paired up for the morning and he was in one aircraft, I was in the other. And uh, I, I was leading the pair of aircraft, which I remember as being a, a little bit strange because Les was based out there and knew his way around Germany pretty well, whereas I was just on loan from the UK, had never done a tour in Germany and didn't know my way around all that well. And the Harrier GR3 inertial navigation system was not that reliable. So I was feeling a little bit of pressure and especially since the, the visibility was very poor that day. Mm. But we'd done a couple of trips, everything had gone fine, and we were sitting there waiting for another target to come in, and there was a long delay, and it was October. It was actually a lovely day. Uh, the sun was shining, it was quite warm. And uh, when we were waiting to be tasked, if there was nothing coming in, we'd be put on a separate landline so we could just talk between the two of us to keep ourselves entertained. So we, we were sitting on this landline, just bantering away, having a laugh, you see. And, and uh, meanwhile, our ground crew had refueled the aircraft. We were ready to go again. We were just waiting for a task. And then eventually a task came through. We were taken onto another landline, uh, briefed up by the army major as to what we had to do. And eventually we dispatched ourselves and and uh, it, you're always on a fairly tight, tight timeline for these because you had a time on target to make. Yeah. So as soon as you knew you got your task, you're looking at your watch saying, right, we, we've, got about, we've got to be airborne in about six minutes from now. You know, so you have a quick chat about the routing and everything. And then you start the engine and off you go. So we taxied out, got airborne in good shape. I went off first, Les joined me and we uh, went out into the designated area. We spoke to our forward air controller out there about our target and we were just positioning for the target run. When I felt, I was in a turn at the time, and I, I didn't see anything, but I felt a couple of thumps through the airframe, quite pronounced thumps. And if you had a bird strike, you didn't necessarily feel it. And I thought, well, that's not a bird strike. I thought, well, that's not right at all. And there's just a doom doom from, from behind me, which is where the engine is. I thought, I'm mm, not happy about that at all. So I just rolled out of the turn, pulled up to about 1,500 feet, and said to Les, best you come and have a look at my aircraft because I'm not sure everything's all right. So I'm sitting there looking at all the engine instruments, the uh, warning panel, which should be telling me if anything's wrong, look at the hydraulic systems, absolutely nothing, everything's fine. I'm thinking, oh. Les comes along, has a look around the aircraft, so he's in close formation, just flying underneath me and having a good look around. And uh, ironically enough, at the point that he said, looks all right to me, that was the point at which the engine stopped. Oh. So, <laughs> so at that point, I, I pulled up because the first thing you do is convert excess speed to height. So I pulled up, and that's the last time Les saw me because he disappeared out in front of me. And I said the, the visibility was not good that day. So he never saw me again after that. So I pulled up. I probably didn't get much more than another four or 500 feet. And then I was at 2,000 feet, bunting over to get into a glide. Um, and sorting out relighting the engine because the engine was just not developing any thrust. So first thing is that the aircraft um, gliding speed was 250 knots. Now, Harrier is a heavy aircraft. It's got a very small wing, 
when you're gliding at 250 knots, you're coming down very steeply. So mm -hmm. all I'm looking at is a lot of German countryside coming up to meet me very quickly, which is quite my own focusing. So anyway, the, the relight drill for the Harrier engine was very straightforward. We practice it in the simulator a lot. So I, I had no qualms about what I needed to do. So I shut the engine down fully, did a relight, the aircraft relit. But as soon as I started advancing the throttle, absolutely nothing happened. It, oh, it just started rumbling and, and you could hear horrible noises coming from the back. And I thought, no, I'm not getting any thrust out of this thing. So I shut it down again. I thought I've got time to give it another go, gave it another go. Absolutely same response, the engine relit, but wouldn't produce any thrust. So at that point, I thought, right, I'm out of here. So I shut the engine down, just called ejecting, pulled the handle in, I was out of there. And that was that. What was it like actually ejecting? Do you um, remember any of it? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was, it was, it was interesting because I, I remember my very last thought having transmitted ejecting. I remember sitting there, just reaching down for the handle thinking, I hope this works because if it doesn't, it's not going to be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Any injuries? Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah. Just, just to go back to what was it like? It's very violent, to be honest. Even that's a rocket seat. That was a Mark Nine seat. Mm -hmm. So, the initial um, boot up the backside that pushes the aircraft out of the, sorry, the seat out of the aircraft is a cartridge, uh, like shotgun cartridge that fires you off. But it then trips a lanyard, which fires a rocket pack. So the rocket pack is what really accelerates you away and upwards. So even allowing for the fact that that's comparatively a fairly gentle acceleration compared with the early ejection seats, which just relied on a very hard bang up the backside. Mm -hmm. It's still pretty violent, so it's very rapid acceleration, which you certainly know about. And then before you know it, um, the seat's dropping away from you, your parachute's deployed, and you're there going, oh, here I am, everything's all right. <laughs> so anyway, um, a short time later, I'm coming down. And yes, to answer your question, I managed to damage my ankle on landing. Oh. I had a bit of a sideways drift on, and I um, sprained my ankle very badly. I thought it was broken, it hurt so much. But in fact, it was just badly sprained. Oh. So I was hopping Looking. around afterwards, and all these German people appeared from nowhere. I was out in the middle of the countryside, but within no time at all, there's about 20 Germans around me <laughs> looking very concerned. I'm thinking, why are they so concerned? I'm up, you know, maybe hobbling around a bit. But in fact, what had happened was I got quite a few cuts in my face here from the um, detonating cord oh. and the canopy, which had actually cut into my cheek here. And I had blood all down here, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I was covered in blood. So, so that's why the Germans were a bit concerned concern for me, but I, I was all right. And uh, I was only on the ground there for a matter of, it seemed like a very short time, you know, no more than 10 minutes, probably, probably less, when one of our helicopters pitched up from the main base at Guttersloe, uh, flown by a guy who used to be a flying instructor at Linton News with me, and John Day, who went on to become Commander-in-Chief at Strike Command, but he, he pitched up in his helicopter, whisked me away and uh, delivered me to Guttersloe, and they went right off to hospital and get your leg put in plaster, and that was that.